Modern science starts with an incredible man. Who invented a new branch of math called calculus, figured out the composition of light, and gave us the laws of gravity and motion which govern the universe. The man who is considered the founder of modern science, Sir Isaac Newton. Newton's work has a beauty and a simplicity and an elegance that makes it the greatest work of science ever done. This incredible scientific mind looked into gravity, light, perspective, the ideas of religion. He also looked into the science of the elements. Newton was elected a member of the Royal Society, a group of leading scientists in London. Most of them were awed by the whiz kid from Cambridge. And Newton was so delighted that he promised to send the Royal Society a paper he had written on his discovery that white light is made up of different colors. Newton's keen mind was also expansive as he started to look at the ideas of life and what was happening in this blend of items of the universe, time itself. His private notebooks reveal that the same year he became a professor at Cambridge, he bought two furnaces, an assortment of chemicals, and a strange set of books. Isaac Newton had become an alchemist. Alchemy is the exciting study of the transmutation of matter, energy, and time. An exciting concept, an expansive concept. I welcome you to The Alchemist. Alchemy is an ancient and secret practice with roots in the Middle East. By carrying out lengthy and complex chemical procedures, alchemists try to produce a magical substance called the Philosopher's Stone. The search for the Philosopher's Stone. There were many famous alchemists. The list is way too long. Here's just a short list. People trying to find out some of the secrets of the universe and the secrets of life. One of Newton's recipes, called the net, comes from the writings of the Roman poet Ovid. In his poem, The Metamorphosis, Ovid tells the story of the god Vulcan catching his wife, Venus, in bed with the god Mars. According to the myth, Vulcan made a fine metallic net and hung the lovers from the ceiling for all to see. In alchemy, Venus, Mars, and Vulcan mean copper, iron, and fire. Viewed this way, the myth becomes an alchemical recipe. And if Bill Newman has interpreted the recipe correctly, he should get the same results that Newton got 300 years ago. A purple alloy known as the net, which was believed to be one step towards the Philosopher's Stone. Many have sought the Philosopher's Stone, the concept of alchemy, inside the laboratory. But what if this was actually inside biology, inside the cells of all of us? Historians have also discovered that Newton was not alone in pursuing alchemy. Other scientists of the day, including members of the Royal Society, were alchemists too. Perhaps Newton's alchemy was less an occult practice than another way to investigate the natural world. Carl Jung could see alchemy. I was always looking for for something in between, you know, something that linked that remote past with, with the present moment. Uh, and I found, to my amazement, it is alchemy. Carl Jung found that alchemy could be the link of the human brain to understand time. Not just matter and energy, but time. Alchemy was really matter theory. Alchemy was a science which pursued the most basic questions of what is the earth, what is all of the universe made up of, what are the components of matter. It was a profound element to the practice of alchemy, which really 
it makes it deserving of being called early modern chemistry. The basis of our modern way of perceiving things, uh, and, and therefore it is as if it were right under the threshold of consciousness. Uh, uh, this is a, a wonderful picture of how uh, the development of archetypes, that means the movement of, of archetypes, uh, looks uh, when you look upon them as if from above, maybe from today you look back into the past and you see how the present moment has evolved out, out of the past. He's not a madman playing around with strange spiritist substances. He's trying to actually figure out how to change material particles around to get one thing out of something else. And that's not so weird. Alchemy is an expansion of mind to understand the transformation and transmutation of the elements and the potentials of the human spirit and the human mind because those potentials are infinite. And we can construct or even predict our, uh, the, the, the cultures of our days when we know what, what it has been yesterday. Carl Jung saw alchemy and dreams as the transmutation window for us to see into the future. Here is the rebus. This is an ancient symbol of alchemy. It's a symbol of a hermaphrodite, male and female, where these opposing forces of male and female need to be unified by transformation, transmutation to maximize the potential of the human brain, the human mind. Now, we, getting back to elements, we saw that Rutherford showed us how the items can be transmutated. Curvran developed the idea that there was a transmutation inside biology, and he wrote many books on that. We started working on this as well. Here at Youngstown State University, way back in the 70s and 80s, I joined forces with the Nobel Prize winner, William Fowler, we co-authored a paper on the transmutation of the elements. And as we started to see this, we started to analyze the different elements and realize that transformation was possible and that alchemy was possible. What Dr. Fowler and I had found is that with slow nucleus capture of the neutron, and then with that neutron decaying, beta minus decay, that neutron could be converted to a proton. And then potassium could be converted to calcium. Amazing. We had already seen this in science with magnesium to sodium, and that this ability of the beta decay of a neutron into a proton, this has happened, this was basically found, and that it had happened in many other type of elements that have been known to science. So this was indeed a real thing. This has been seen in the laboratory with radioactive materials, but could it be that we have now found that improved alchemy and that we have been able to show without a, without a doubt it was possible that we found the Philosopher's Stone. And the Philosopher's Stone we found inside biology. And we've proven that alchemy inside biology was possible. But what about our, the old idea of gold? Well, our idea of the slow neutron capture would apply if we could, wanted to convert platinum to gold. Uh, but wait a minute, platinum is more expensive than gold. Uh, we could not find any other way. So the idea of converting into gold, that has eluded us. So we were able to kind of give up on that precept. But back to biology, the basic concept of breatharians, being able to live just on breath, taking in the carbon, the oxygen, the nitrogen, if life could only be possible if there was a transmutation of the elements. So to understand biology, we must understand breatharians, they do exist, documented in all the major religions. And only through transmutation would that be possible. But we see that this is through the religions 
So you have to have a spiritualness in order to be a breatharian. Autophagy might be able to explain part of the idea of the breatharian, being able to recycle their own cells. But in order to really understand, we'd have to be able to show nitrogen conversion, we'd have to absorption and conversion, we have to show the sunshine, and we'd have to show the transmutation of the elements. And normally people make fun of breatharians. They take one breatharian and make fun of them, but you see it only takes one white crow to prove that white crows exist. Just one breatharian. And I think there's a lot more than one. So we need to be able to look at breatharians with a little bit more of an open mind, more of a Buddhist mind, and then understand. Now we will see more of the powers of the mind when we turn off the verbal parts, going into the Buddhist philosophy. People draw great pride and inspiration from here. Ram Bonjan, a 15-year-old boy, has been meditating in dense jungle without food or water for 10 months. Many suggest he is a physiological and cognitive freak with such immense power of mind over matter that it could change the way we look at modern science and medicine forever. If he's truly gone without food and water, it's difficult to explain on a purely scientific basis, so you'd have to bring in spirituality in here. The longest a person can go without food has been documented as being around two and a half months before you die of starvation. In an open environment, uh, breathing normally with, with warm air surrounding you without any fluid at all, you would last between four, perhaps five days. Rambon Jan has not eaten, and more importantly, not drunk anything for ten months. I studied similar cases in the past, and this is possible. Through his deep meditation, he's gone into a hibernating state, and he is living on spiritual energy. I can't accept that. Um, it goes against what I know about how the body works, about the nutrition that you need. He's getting food and he's getting fluid from somewhere. He is surviving on nourishment. The question is, what kind of nourishment? We can't, as Westerners, tap into using spiritual force and spiritual energy for nourishment. That's the key here. To endure solitary existence in extreme conditions, yogic techniques enable you to focus your mind over your body's suffering. Obviously, if he's genuine, uh, has to use some yogic techniques like feeding on the air, feeding on the breath. He fascinated to see the boy who is fasting for six to eight months and that is uh, not at all really uh, so exciting to me because I studied similar cases in the past and I can understand this is possible. Dr. Shah's most famous case is Pralad Jani, a holy man who claims he has not eaten or drunk anything since he was 12. I haven't eaten anything, not even now, even though I'm 80 years old. That made me really quite excited because... I, I knew that this is something uh, going to change the feeling of medical work. Although I walk 100, 200 kilometers in the jungle, I never sweat, nor feel tired or sleepy. I can meditate for 3, 8 or 12 hours or even months. Pralat Jani recently spent 10 days in observation watched and filmed 24 hours a day. So here we see basically some type of a proof of that breatharians do exist and that they do have an ability beyond the ability to get nutrition, sunshine, take nitrogen out of the air, transmutate the elements. And now we have to think of a new idea regarding deficiencies of nutrients, about the spirituality not just getting nutrients, but being able to take those nutrients, those minerals, and transmutate them, having the spirituality. And now what we've done, we've basically found the Philosopher's Stone, the principles of alchemy, and showed that they really have a reality. We have to expand our mind. Here's an excerpt taken from Isaac Newton's book on alchemy. So, 
Inside biology, we found the philosopher's stone of alchemy. And it broadens our mind into looking into other different things, into the mind itself. And our good friend Carl Jung was right. Alchemy is a psychological process. A psychological process that can affect physiology.